Hello, today is Sunday, February 22nd, Dallas, Texas, USA. That's the central uh, standard time. And it's around very close to 7.30 p.m. And I'm giving, preparing this recorded presentation as a backup presentation because in about two and a half hours, which is at 10 p.m. and that will be 9.30 a.m. Uh, in India, Indian Standard Time uh, at the uh, IFHE, the law school in Hyderabad in India. I would like to thank the organizer, Professor uh, Ritu to, for having invited me to give this distinguished guest lecture and I'm truly honored and so I'm going to send this presentation to Dr. Ritu so that just in case there is a technology glitch, she can then uh, play this uh, presentation. However, I am going to be present to give this presentation live. It's going to take about one hour. So, by the way, I'm Dr. Bhavani Thuraisingam. Uh, I'm a Founders Chair Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Dallas in the USA. Okay, so I'm now going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, so the title of my lecture, sorry, I got the dates a little mixed up. It's actually, today is February 19th, um, 2023, and it's going to be, uh, the presentation is going to be given live at 10 p.m. my time, which is going to be 9.30 a.m. on February 20th, 2023, India time. That's Monday. Okay. So the title of my talk, Secure Cloud Computing, Technologies, Applications, Policies, and Governance. Okay. There are a lot of topics that I'm going to cover. Okay. So I'm going to put all these topics together. I'm going to give some references. And so because I'm covering you know, secure cloud co uh, computing concepts and technologies and policies. And for policies, I'm going to talk about how we can use policies to share information as well as enforce privacy. And then I'll talk a little bit about the attacks to the cloud and then cloud governance, and then provide some directions. Okay, so the first part, secure cloud computing concepts and technology. So what is, in general, before we look at cloud computing, what is secure cloud computing? The question is, what is cloud computing? So the National Institute of Standards and Technology, that's NIST, they have defined cloud computing as follows. And that's their exact definition. Cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources. So these could be network, servers, storage, applications, operating systems, and services that can be rapidly provisioned to a number of users because there are only so many resources and these resources have to be provisioned and released with minimal management efforts or service provider interaction. So clouds are managed by cloud service provider. Examples are Amazon AWS, and another example is the Azure Cloud, Microsoft, IBM as a cloud, Salesforce Cloud, and so on. So with minimal interaction with the service provider. Okay, so over the past decade, use of cloud computing has exploded. So I would say more like past two, past 15 years. Practically now, every company, regardless of whether it's a large, medium, small business, is taking advantage of all the services the cloud has to offer to reduce costs as well as for several other benefits, including increasing computation power and storage capabilities. So in this way, you don't have to buy all of the equipment, the storage and so on, application storage, network servers, and operating systems and PCs, because you can rent all of that information, all of the resources from the cloud, right? And so, especially for small companies when they cannot afford, right, they could, um, rent all these services from the cloud. Large companies, they might want to have a hybrid cloud. Some they can use a public cloud. Sometimes they can also build their own private cloud. But if you're having sensitive information, right, that's where the challenge comes. Because once you store the information in the cloud, I mean, you can encrypt that information, but when you decrypt that information, you know, it can be attacked, 
right? So that is the biggest challenge that we have with the cloud. So cloud computing is based on a service-oriented model and provides many services to users, including, again, infrastructure platform software, and more so, it can also offer data as service. You can store all of the data in the cloud and share the data. You can also, and that's the application I'm going to talk about, uh, and it's all provided as services. In fact, you can even provide security as a service, such as email spam detection, insider threat detection, email filtering. You can send all of the email to the cloud. It can do all the work and send it back to the company, cleaned email. So cloud can be used for security applications and every other application, but the cloud itself has to be secure. That's the challenge because we can, you know, use the cloud when we want to just store photographs and all kinds of stuff. But if you want to put your healthcare data in the cloud, then that becomes very tricky because for one thing, you can encrypt the data and put it in the cloud, but then there is a problem, right? Because you have to do all kinds of operations with the data, select project, join, and so on. And so once you decrypt the data, right, security is gone. So that is the challenge. So the, the challenge we are faced with is to keep the data encrypted in the cloud and then do all the operations. So theoretically, it's been proved feasible, but practically not. Okay, so again, continuing, uh, very briefly, clouds being deployed, it could be public cloud like Amazon AWS, private clouds, corporations can build their own cl uh, clouds and it could be hybrid cloud. Sometimes you can have community, hybrid is public and private. You can have communities getting together to develop their own community clouds, right? Regardless of the type of cloud being deployed. Again, security for the cloud has become a major consideration. And there are different types of clouds, including those that provide infrastructures, those that provide infrastructures and platforms like databases and programming and you can also provide, cloud can also provide infrastructures, platform, and software. Software is essentially applications. And more recently, there are additional services like cloud can provide you with the data. Science and engineers, scientists and engineers need data to test all their system, all their experiments and applications. And cloud can also provide you with security service, healthcare service, income tax service, financial service, and so on. So associated with security is the governance of the cloud, right? For example, how should the cloud be managed? What are the policies enforced on the cloud? How is the cloud impacted by the regulations? Who should be responsible for the organization's cloud? I mean, these are all governance aspects. And later on, I'll briefly talk about governance. Okay, so I've given you sort of an introduction to cloud computing. What we developed is a framework for secure cloud computing. So what you see on the left-hand side is more generic and the right-hand side is the specific technologies we have used. So for instance, at the bottom is secure virtual machine monitor, right? Sorry, virtual network monitor. So you have just one physical network, but you can virtualize it so that you can have multiple physical networks, okay? So sorry, mul multiple logical networks, but eventually they all have to map into the physical network. This way, it can, the network resources could be shared. Similarly, at the operating system level, you have the virtual machine monitor operating system. There's only one host operating system, many guest operating systems, and they all have to share the resources. And then, of course, a storage manager, the data manager, and the user interface applications. Then, of course, you've got the policies that have to govern everything, the quality of service, the risks and costs, and cloud monitors, monitoring whether the cloud has been attacked. And so all of these layers, they have to be secured. Okay, so I have different color schemes in the right-hand side. So if I don't use a color scheme, that means we have just assumed that the secure virtual network monitor is provided. Our work has been secure uh, virtual uh, machine monitor like Zen developed at the University of Cambridge, Linux virtual machine, uh, VMware virtual machine. So uh, this part, whenever I have something in pink, it needs still more work. We've done some work, you still have to do more work. But so risks for the cloud, essentially risk cost, governance and so on. That's something we need to do more work and we can build more and more applications. And what we have really investigated fairly thoroughly is how are policies enforced? 
So policies are enforced in different standard languages and protocols. XACML is extensible access control markup language and RDF is resource description framework, but now more or less uh, a standard is XACML, right? For web services, because remember cloud is providing services, which could be web services. So XACML is the policy, usually our policy engines and protocols are XACML, but we have also used RDF, which also brings semantics. And then we look briefly about how you allocate resources, the quality of service, and how do you monitor the cloud? And then of course, our query storage. Storage, we can use many different technologies, right? There is Spark, and but we used, sorry, Hadoop MapReduce uh, storage technology. And then on top of that, we built our query manage, secure query manager. So we secured Hadoop and secured MapReduce, and then secure uh, query manager, two types of query processing, one for relational data and one for semi-structured, unstructured, uh, geospatial, uh, multimedia data, right? The applications, the number of applications we focused on, how do you securely share information? That is our focus. Okay, so the secure storage, we looked at secure Hadoop and secure MapReduce. There are various aspects. This is our research, right? So there are various aspects you can look at. So I'm not saying that this work here, some of my colleagues, Dr. Kevin Hamlin with his students, uh, it was a very interesting piece of work, one of the early pieces of work on Hadoop security. So you remember security is essentially CIA. That means confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So we focus more on the trust which will give us more integrity. It could also give us some confidentiality and maybe some availability as well. So there's security, privacy, trust, all of those features, but we just looked at one aspect of security for this research. But we are assuming when we develop our system, developed our system, we are assuming that the Hadoop MapReduce framework is providing sort of complete security, right? But our research, because we are only a small group, so we can only focus on certain aspects of the research. So what did we do? This is the Hadoop uh, structure. It's a file system. Uh, it has something called name nodes, right? That will uh, decide uh, where to send all the uh, tasks to because a lot of jobs are coming in. And so the jobs have to go to the data nodes to perform all the jobs. And there are a number of data nodes that contain the data to carry out the jobs. And for what we do is for uh, reliability purposes, we also replicate, you know, these nodes, and then these nodes are also uh, divided into groups, group one, group two, and so on, group K. Okay, so essentially the idea, our system, our secure trust management system for Hadoop is called Hatman. Data and computation integrity and security are major concerns, right, for cloud computing. Uh, many production level clouds, they assume that all the nodes are trustworthy. Right, because in order for the nodes to perform their tasks, right, that confidentiality or privacy or data execution or whatever, they have to be trusted. If they are not trusted, then you know everything is going to be messed up. There's no security. So, because we are assuming everything is trusted, it increases their vulnerability to attack since compromising even one node can compromise everything, right? So, the paper that we discussed in this, what we've shown has presented an eva and evaluates the system we call is HATMAN, H-A-T-M-A-N. So we call it HAT HATMAN, that's Dr. Hamlin, my colleague. And it's really the first full-scale data-centric reputation management for Hadoop. So essentially what we do, HAT HATMAN dynamically assess for every node that has to perform tasks, HATMAN will dynamically assess the node's integrity, right? By comparing job replica outputs for consistency. So look at what the outputs that they have performed and then look at the consistency of the outputs and then decide, is this node trusted or not? And you can also do trust through reputation. You can poll the other nodes to find out, do you think this node is trusted? So there are a number of ways you can build this reputation. So this is an agreement feedback for a trust manager based on something that was developed, a particular technique at, I believe, at MIT, eigentrust, okay, reputation management for peer-to-peer. -peer. So all the peers decide and uh, determine what the trust level is. And once you have the trust levels for these nodes, then you can give them highly confidential tasks or top secret, top secret jobs 
or high priority jobs and so on. That's the whole idea. So that's the aspect of security we are providing. So the last bullet here, low, low overhead and high scalability is achieved by formulating both. We have to check for the consistency of the answers, and then we've got to check for the trust, right? So cloud distributed computing power is leveraged to strengthen the security. So that is uh, secure storage, right? And that is the, uh, the secure Hadoop. Now, the other part of the storage is MapReduce, right? Hadoop and MapReduce go hand in hand. Hadoop is the file system and it's all having all these data nodes and the name nodes, data nodes are performing all the tasks. What MapReduce does is gets all the jobs, right? And then it makes it easier, breaks it apart and then puts it all back together, right? So that's, that's the job of MapReduce. So for the MapReduce, my colleagues again, Murat Kantajalu, Dr. Kevin Hamlin, the students, um, we demonstrate how a broad class of safety policy, including fine grain access. So here we are looking at access control, access control policies at the level of key value. Remember, we are using uh, big data, right? Big data is key value, column oriented, key value pairs rather than files because Hadoop is file, but we are, separate, we are decomposing or we are put, splitting it apart into key value pairs, right? can be elegantly, so MapReduce works very well with key value pairs. So it takes all the data and then first what it does is applies the policies and then it does the map, map mapping part and then it does the reduce part and then it gives the output. So the approach realizes policy enforcement as a middleware layer, right? And rewrites the cloud's front-end API with reference monitors. So this is sort of the cloud's front-end API and the reference monitor is that part of the system that has to be secure. So users are submitting jobs and then the administration is configuring the system and all the policies are generated and sort of the data comes in and here are the jobs and here are all the predicates for the policies are applied on the data and then they are mapped to a different set of data, intermediate data, and then it's reduced, all the data is reduced to produce the output. So. Um, after rewriting the jobs run on input data authorized by, again, fine grain, this fine grain access control, allowing them to be safely executed with additional system level controls. So this is what we are doing, uh, vigils, uh, uh, um, applying fine grain access control to the data. Okay. So another aspect we looked at is we talk, a third part of our storage is we talked about hybrid cloud, right? Some of the data should be in the, uh, in the public cloud, some data in the uh, private cloud. So the data that is in the public cloud could be sort of data that is not confidential, but in the private cloud, we have to put, keep all the confidential data. data. So in this small uh, project, what we did, my colleague, Dr. Murat Kantarjulu and his team, uh, the use of hybrid clouds is an emerging trend in cloud computing. So ability to exploit public resources. So we want public resources because why reinvent the wheel when it's out there, right? Yet better able to control costs and data privacy. Several key challenges. So here we focused on how do you design your data? Which data goes to the public cloud? Which data goes to the private cloud? And in order to design, we need to look at various aspects, parameters. Right, because remember, we want everything to be secure and private. So that's costly, but we can mask and mask and mask and mask the data where the data becomes useless. So utility is important. We can't just over mask the data, right? So we need utility and costs, right? So we need to also be cost effective. So in order to do that, what do we mean by cost? Query workload, right? How much does it cost to execute the query? So. Query processing then becomes how to execute a query over a hybrid cloud. Solution must provide query rewrite. Queries have to be rewrite according to the various policies and show correctness of a generated query plan over the hybrid cloud. So the main point here is with utility, the cost and security slash privacy and everything has to be taken into consideration in order to what it becomes a dynamic programming problem. That is what we are doing. So I need to add one more bullet here uh, before my main talk, and that is dynamic programming problem. We have, it's the optimization problem. 
what's the best that you can do in order to partition this data and put some of the data into the private cloud, some of the data into the public cloud. That's another piece of work we did. Okay. And there are many other things with respect to security. So I'm here talking about the concepts and technologies, okay? So identity management considerations, very important. Identity and access control. What are some of the standards? Trust model, I already talked about trust model with respect to Hatman, various trust relationships, access control policies based on roles and attributes. Again, what is the appropriate access control policy? Is it role-based? Is so, but it's more or less consensus for cloud, we need attribute-based access control. User comes in presence, he saw her credentials, objects, the, the resources and objects have attributes, based on the credentials and the attributes, access is granted. Access is not just to the data. What is interesting about service-oriented paradigm, you can have access to a building, you can have access to a job, you can have access to a medical appointment or medical um, uh, sort of hospital. These are, uh, you can have access to a class, right? If you fulfill the obligations, if you have the proper credentials, like proper qualifications or whatever, right? And according to the policies, access granting can be granted. And so several technologies have been examined and they're still being examined. Uh, Service-oriented technologies are really taking off now for the cloud. SAML, security assertion markup language. What is SAML doing? SAML can make all kinds of assertions about the fact that say Dr. Bhavani Thuraisingham is a professor, uh, John Smith is a student. These are the assertions, the credentials. XACML, and I'm going to talk about it more. Uh, it's about extensible access control markup language. It is a language, it's a language as well as it's a protocol. It will tell you exactly, exactly how attribute-based access control should be designed, right? What happens when a user presents the credentials, credentials have to be verified, all kinds of encryption and key management in the verification. Objects have attributes. So you have to look at the policies. Can this subject, the user, have access to the resources that is getting a job, getting into class, accessing a database, and so on. So there's a lot of work on XACML and SAML, and also open ID, some open standards have also been developed. And the question is, does one size fit all, right? Just, you have, just because you have SAML and XACML, open ID, can you apply it to all the clouds? And that's where a lot of the research is focusing. So can we develop a trust model that will be applicable to all types of clouds, such as private clouds, public clouds, hybrid clouds, identity architecture has to be uh, hybrid clouds and identity architecture has to be integrated into the cloud architecture. Okay, so another piece of work we did is you got to monitor. Cloud could be attacked and I'll talk to you about some of the attacks. So remember, in typically in a cloud, what happens is when you have virtualization like Zen and uh, uh, vSphere or uh, VMware or whatever, that's the hypervisor. That's also called the hypervisor, right? So you've got the hardware and then the hypervisor. On top of that, you've got various types of operating systems. So let's assume the Linux is, our, uh, Linux is the host operating system and then several others could be the guest operating systems but they all have to share the resources imagine linux solaris X, 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 xp mac os if they all work together they can overwrite each other right so the hypervisor has to make sure they're all separated but that means the hypervisor is going to be overburdened right a lot of work for the hypervisor so researchers are looking at where do you put the burden so maybe some functions hypervisor can monitor some functions, maybe the individual operating systems can do their own monitoring. Both have their pros and cons. If individual operating systems, each of them have a monitor, it could have, you know, they call the antivirus explosion, right? It could take so much space. So the challenge here is how much should the hypervisor monitor and how much should these individual operating systems monitor? And that's what we are trying to, one of my colleagues, Dr. Ji Chang Lin, was trying to work on cloud integrity and forensics. And so you can see if they are attacked, right? Integrity is violated. Some formal methods, secure control flow of hypervisor code, some formal methods are being applied. Uh, example, integrity via inline reference monitor. And you can see, right? The bad guy is trying to attack and for forensics data extraction in the cloud. And so these are some of the work that we've been doing. So you can see, we all have to look with a magnifying glass 
to see where is the problem, right? So let's see. Uh, I just want to show what the last thing was. I maybe I. Okay, so okay, so that finishes most of the cloud technologies and security technologies before we go into the policies, applications, and attacks and governance. But one thing I want to tell you. Remember I said, cloud can give you security as a service. So cloud can provide you with some security functions in an organization. Remember, you have to understand that is separate from the cloud being secure. Cloud being secure is what I talked all this time, right? XACML, SAML, and the secure Hadoop, secure MapReduce, and so on. Cloud has to be secure. Because what's the point in having an insecure cloud if you want to use it for email spam detection or malware analysis, right? Yet cloud can be very, very useful because these tasks are extremely time cons consuming. So we have, so what we did was we had developed a number of uh, machine learning or data mining algorithms, right? For malware analysis. That means for uh, malware analysis, meaning is it a, uh, is it a bad uh, software, malware, malicious software, or is it not? So a number of machine learning algorithms, but it's very timely time consuming to train it and so on, a lot of time. So we thought, why not use the cloud to see how much we can improve, okay? So this is our algorithm. I won't go into detail. I mean, we have a number of papers. I can, you can email Dr. Ritu and she can email me. I can give you the corresponding paper. Some, I haven't given all the references, sorry. So stream of known malware, it goes to the buffer, feature extraction, training, and then we have to test. But it's very, very time consuming, right? So what do we do? We used a cloud. So we took the algorithm that we had developed a few years before, and we can't just port the entire algorithm, I mean, uh, software into one machine. We've got to take that software and break it apart and take advantage of all, all what the cloud has to offer. So, so we looked at binary, so we looked at binary feet. So in our particular algorithm, we extract engrams, binary engrams, and assembly engrams. And so you can see there are millions and millions, it could even be billions of engrams that we are extracting. We've got to throw away some of the features and it's extremely time consuming. And what we are saying is, our, this is our algorithm, okay? We can use a cloud to uh, improve the performance. So a cloud MapReduce framework is used to extract and select features from each chunk, a 10 node cloud cluster. So we look, use a 10 node cloud and so, especially for the feature extraction, that is extremely time consuming when you have say 200 million features in one machine. So we use the cloud, 10 nodes, we split the uh, algorithms into different parts and implemented the algorithm, re-implemented in the cloud. And so we found the 10 node cluster is 10 times faster. So it's really very, very uh, beneficial for us to use the cloud sorry, to use the cloud to carry out this uh, security features. In this case, cloud is providing us with security as a service. Okay, now I go to cloud applications and also in the process, I will also talk about policies. And in particular, the application that we want to talk about is information sharing. So we had a large project on information sharing among, securely sharing among partners. Okay, first, we didn't have any cloud. Okay, so without a cloud, just a database environment, how do you share information? So uh, there were three parts to our work and I'm only going to talk about the first part. Okay, that's my part. And the second part was Dr. Murad Kantajalu and third part was Dr. Kevin Hamler. So policy and incentive-based sharing. So because if people don't share information, then we are losing out. Some valuable information could be lost. Yet security and privacy are important. So you can't share everything. So what we thought was uh, enforce policies and determine how much information has been lost. So by not sharing, we want to measure. So we looked at what information that we were, that was, that, that would be generated, shared without any policies. And as we increase those policies, I will tell you what the policies are, Let's give some examples. Then how, how much information have been, has been lost, valuable information because of these policies. Right, and then we also did some work on 
What are the risks involved in sharing from respect to security? And what incentives can we give? So we wanted to test to see if we give them some money, $1 or something, are they going to share more information? So that was a very nice exercise. We worked with cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive neuroscientists and behavioral economists. So it was a very interesting piece of work. The second part I'm not going to talk more is applying game theory. So Dr. Murad did some work on game theory to probe and extract information from semi-trustworthy partners. Uh, because we are saying not all partners are, you know, trustworthy. In this world, we've got to work with people we do not trust or semi-trust. So here we are saying for people we trust, still we may need, still need to uh, implement policies, right? So for example, between UK and US, right? We have sort of friendly partners, but that doesn't mean we want to freely share everything. Second is for semi-trustworthy, I'm saying, okay, we may want to play games and try to see how we can win the game, get more information from the other person. So I'll give you examples of policies. And the third, we say we have to actively defend because if you are working with partners who are not trustworthy at all, we still have to work with them, right? They are going to be watching out for us, trying to probe and get information or try to monitor or try to plant malware in our system to get information. So we have to defend ourselves, right? So essentially we have to carry out active defense because we have to find out what our partners are doing by monitoring them so that we can defend our defend ourselves from dynamic situations. Okay, so what, what do we mean by policies? Now, remember, I'm a computer scientist and we work with something toy, T-O-Y policies, right? Because so now, now that was, these were policies for those days. Now we were working with top policy experts to come up with realistic policies, right? So. What we did at that time, agency one wants to share resources with agency two, right? Provided I say, okay, I will share, but you also share with me. Or I will ask agency two, give me justification why you want my resource. Or I will say, I will share with you, provided you don't share with agency three. And I will say, okay, I'll share with you only until a certain time. Or I will say, I will share, I will do some quick analysis and say, if I share this data with agency two, then agency two already has a lot of information. Agency two could deduce something that is highly sensitive. That's inference problem. And agency one shares a resource with agency two, provided agency two shares the resource only with those people in its network. So, so these, so what we did was we actually implemented eventually in the cloud, agency one is, we say Dallas, between three countries universities actually. Agency two is King's College, University of London. And agency three could be University of Insubria, Italy. Three of us work together, okay? And so for instance, uh, initially there was no cloud by the way, okay? So we just had some databases and these were Texas Medi Medicaid database, but all the identities removed. Still we want to see, can some information be, be gleaned? And this is XACML. This, this box here is policy engine, right? XACML, remember extensible access control markup language. The user comes in, pre presents all the credentials uh, and the, all the objects in the database have got attributes and the policies will say, based on the user's credential and attributes, what information can be shared. Great. And that was in a simple environment. Now we said a sponsor, because we are three, three of us are working Three organizations are working, right? So we can't have a, a system like this. This is really within an organization. Across the organizations, we have to use a cloud. So we came up with, it's a big data problem because you can't just put relational databases in the cloud. We have to have special uh, big data databases. So we first, um, our cloud, remember, is Hadoop MapReduce. And we have assumed for Hadoop, we have Hetman. For MapReduce, we have Vigils. But for our implementation, we just assume that it's providing all the security. Okay. So we have studied clouds based on Hadoop and later on we went to Spark. So query rewriting and optimization techniques designed and implemented for two types of data, right? So remember I said we work with relational data and that we used, uh, Facebook had developed a open, first they had developed a proprietary relational big data system called Hive and they made it open source and now it's Apache. So we did uh, information sharing with Hive. And then for non-relational data like video and images and so on, we shared information with RDF. Okay, that's a semantic web type data uh, formats. And we demonstrated with XACML are uh, the policies. 
And it was done 2013. That was our first demo. And then with one cloud and multiple clouds with, uh, with was our second demo. So King's College and University of Insubria. Okay, so this is our system architecture. Remember, Hive is, Hadoop is here, HDFS. On top of that Hive that Facebook provided is open source. This is what we implemented, right? XACML policy engine. So, and that is our collaborate come 2010. So users can create tables and load data, and they can also upload XACML policies. Us users can also create policies for tables views. Users can define views. Anyway, all these policies are created and we have to, we implemented this. It is a pretty heavy implementation, right? And so we, and then we demonstrated, okay, so that is, this is for uh, relational data. For semantic web data, it was more challenging for us like so semantic web meaning for images and geospatial data and video, we didn't test with video, like images, assuming video and multimedia would work too, relational didn't suit us. But unfortunately, for semantic web data, we didn't have a high equivalent. We couldn't go and get an open source uh, database for semantic web. So we had to develop a Sparkle. Sparkle is a query, query engine like SQL for relational, Sparkle is the query engine for semantic web data, for RDF. So we had to generate, Lehigh University had all these data generation. So we took all the data, data was being generated and we had to get data all formatted and look at the predicates. I won't go into the details for RDF. And then on the other side, we implemented the XACML policy. So very similar to this XACML, but then we had uh, our own Sparkle query optimizer, but then we also had to generate all this data and running on top of Hadoop. Okay. And so now what did we do for the demonstration? So we had three agencies, Dallas, London, and Insubria. And we had for relational data, it would come to high. Uh, for for uh, non-relational data, it will go to Sparkle query optimizer. So so we had three agencies, right? So what we three organize, we can just, so cloud was in Dallas, right? So everybody can pop their data and their policies and policies meaning I can share with you provided, you know, you will share with me and so on. And so when the queries post say agency one queries and the system will work, whether to go to relational data or uh, Sparkle uh, data, RDF data, and then process the query based on XACML and give the results. Now. Eventually, we will have to encrypt. So we are saying that you know we didn't we didn't encrypt the data. Eventually, to get, get pure security, so this sort of thing would work more in a public cloud, but yet it's an open environment across three countries. So eventually, we have to encrypt the data and work with encrypted data. You know, some of the members of our team are working on that aspect. Now, one problem we had when we demonstrated the system, it took so much time. And so we figured, why is it taking so much time? And then we said, okay, we have mismatched technologies, right? We have relational database, we have RDF database, we have fine-grained, I mean, we have different XACML, but XACML is XML-based. So we have XML, we have uh, relational data, we have semantic web data. It's a complete impedance mismatch. So we said, let's just work with just semantic web data. And so how do we, so semantic with data, we didn't have a, a policy engine, right? So we have done the Sparkle query optimizer, but we need to have a policy engine. Like policy engine is like something like this, right? We have an XACML, we built it. So we need to do that and it has to be implemented in the cloud. So we didn't have much time. Fortunately, another PhD student had developed the RDF policy engine for us, right? for a separate project, not on the cloud. So it used the RDF database on top of that, an inference engine rule processor from University of Maryland College Park. And then all the policies, ontologies and rules, everything is in RDF. And so the engine will look at all the policies and decide what data should be given to the user. This is not in the cloud. So what did we do? We took this data, I mean, took the system. Remember, just like I said, a data, a machine learning system for malware, we re-implemented it in the cloud. Just like that, we took this entire system in this picture and re-implemented the whole thing in the Hadoop MapReduce cloud for performance. So I won't go into the details, but again, we have a paper uh, here. So everything was re-implemented. So that was really great for us, okay? 
And so then we demonstrated it into cloud could be anywhere. It could be in Dallas, London, uh, Italy, all combined. And we have everything in RDF. Nothing is in relational data. And so we have three agencies and this performed actually quite well. So we changed all the, you know, we sort of modified these technologies. Okay, so uh, some, some, something else that we are doing and very briefly, I don't know what the time is right now. Okay, so we have time. I mean, I started at, uh, I started at, uh, let's see my time 7.30. So I've gone about 38 minutes. So I'm trying to finish, um, right. So I was given one hour. So hopefully if I can finish this in about 10 minutes then we'll have 10 minutes for questions, right? Okay, so another thing that we are also concerned about is so much of data, IoT systems all over the place, right? We are carrying Fitbits and blood pressure monitors and all kinds of stuff. Lots of data being collected. It's a good purpose, meaning sociologists and psychologists are doing a work called quantified self. So they want to collect all the data. A lot of companies are also being formed now. So like, uh, you know, coming up with good therapies and so on. So you look at all the data collected, look at what you are, your eating habits and targeted. So if you have diabetes or heart disease or whatever, targeted therapies, right? So kind of psychologically help the person and which is very good, but look at the amount of data we are collecting. And if you put all these data together, all kinds of privacy could be violated, right? So for instance, if there is something called uh, you know, so for glucose monitor, if they find that my, you know, I've got diabetes, so I've got potential to get diabetes, then they might deny not only health coverage for me, for my son, and also for my grandchildren. And that could be disaster, right? And so our challenge then is, uh, and that's what we are saying here, right? So even if you remove, in many cases, even if you remove the personal identifiers, we can put collections of data together and infer something that is highly sensitive. So such privacy violations could easily get out of control if data collectors could aggregate financial and health related data with tweets, Facebook activities, and so on, right? So, so what do we do for that problem? What we did is we came up with privacy aware, everything is policies, policies based quantified self and a data management framework. So with our smartphone, right? We have health data, fitness data, location data, social media, all of that is collected, but we don't randomly collect. Everything is according to policies. Policies will say what health information, what fitness data, what location data. And we also have to tell them how long are we going to keep the data? Not forever and ever and ever until we finish our experiments maybe. And of course, now the, this, is, this whole thing is about the cloud, right? Where does the cloud come in? You can't store all the data in your little gadget. So in an IoT system, this is an example of an IoT system. Some of the data will have to go into the edge or processed in the cloud typically. So lots of all the data, you do some quick analysis and quick policy base and then goes to the cloud and cloud has to do all the detailed analysis, right? Uh, is privacy being violated? So that's what the cloud does. And then there are cloud-based services. So we can anonymize, encrypt and share data through the cloud-based services. Cloud storage is access and then directly or through the services you can query. And so this is what we developed. So again, very quickly, all, I, all we are saying is lots of data being, so I'm repeating what I said earlier, right? This is, a, of course, the device that we implemented, cloud-based, and again, some of the data could be encrypted, right? So cloud plays a central role in IoT. As more data collected, storage device will not be sufficient to store all the data. We envision encrypted cloud storage. Based on access control policies, local apps running on the device will be given access to some collected data. So some data could be here, uh, in the local and some has to be stored in the cloud. And we don't want to put too much data here. So if you're 20 years old, you don't have to weigh yourself every day, right? So for example, if you eat a lot of food and you put on five pounds overnight, it's not so bad if you're 20. You're not going very like, if you're a healthy 20 year old, very likely you'll be okay. But if you are, even if you're a healthy 70 year old, if you eat too much, it's not good for the heart. Right, so for those people, you may want to weigh, but not, uh, I mean, get the weight, store the weight. So you don't have to store each and everything. And sometimes data has to be deleted. What does it mean deleted? There are delete policies. So data collection policies, data sharing policies, data analytics policies, data deletion policies. So everything has to be governed by policies and we need policies to work, policy experts to work with us. 
And we envision data sharing analytics will be carried out, some of them services through the cloud. And depending on some of the scenarios, some data need not be encrypted, some data will have to be encrypted. Okay. Now we come to, we're almost coming to the end. I talk about attacks to the cloud. I only talk about two attacks. And there are many, many attacks you can find. And then I'll talk about governance. Okay. So there is, remember, man in the middle. So between the systems, there's a man in the middle eavesdropping. That attack would be transferred to the cloud. A man in the cloud attack, and you can get it from here, some of the details, is a method that focuses on the manipulation and theft of a user's cloud synchronization token. So users are going to access the cloud. So they are given a token. The users are given a cloud token, synchronized, synchronization token. So victim, right? I have the token, I'm being hit by a malware with malicious website or email, after which once I'm hit and then I go to that website or whatever, attacker now has my token, right? They can access, uh, grant, they can gain access and attacker has the uh, token. So replace the local files by replacing the cloud synchronization token then that synchronization token is replaced and points to the attacker's cloud account, right? Not my account. That is now changed. So they, they have, okay, so I have the token. So what happens? Attacker will come and now uh, has access to my files. It will modify that the token now belongs to them. And so now the cloud can, can the attacker can now have access to all my data, okay? And placing the original token in the selection of files will be synchronized. Victim is led to unknowingly upload their original token to the attacker. That token can then be used by the attacker to gain access to, the, to all of my data. From a protection perspective, malware prevention is key because once the malware is there, it's very hard, okay? Another attack we hear a lot is side channel attack. And there are you know, several, several attacks. So in side channel attacks, what happens? The attacker runs a virtual machine. So it's very, listen, virtual machine is like VMware, right? So attacker is running a virtual machine on the same physical host. Remember, you can have a virtual, so you, you have your virtual machine together with the physical host, right? Uh, on the victim's virtual machine and takes advantage of a shared physical component. So they can share Processor. Remember, hypervisor has to provide the separation, but still they are sharing processors, processor cache in order to steal information. Cryptography. So we need to get the victim's cryptography key. How do we get the key? Once we get the key, then we can do all the decryption and get all the access to the victim's data. Attacker tries to retrieve the value of the cryptography key. These are covert channels, right? By looking at the patterns, how is the memory? So by observing the activity of the processor cache, because the processor has a cache. It looks at how is the cache being manipulated. As it's being manipulated, it knows what number could do this particular manipulation. So by looking at how this, um, this uh, processor cache is manipulated, the attacker can steal the key. Once attacker has the key, it can do all kinds of stuff. It's worth pointing out that we are assuming attacker managed somehow to place his virtual. So in order to this to be successful, uh, attacker has to place his virtual machine in the same physical host of the system. Okay, this operation is not trivial and requires to launch tens of virtual machines. So this is not very straightforward, but a clever attacker can place his virtual machine. That's the challenge. Once you do that, the attacker will be able to watch the processor cache, how it's being manipulated and knows exactly the, uh, the key. Right? That, is the, that is what the attacker wants to steal. So you can see they're very complicated and these attacks happen because of the cloud. And of course we have denial of service and all other types of attacks as well. Okay, so now we talk about cloud governance. What is cloud governance? Main question is who is responsible? So in the cloud governance, the first question is, who will respond, who is responsible for the cloud? Is it the cloud service provider like Amazon Web Services or service provider and the user like us? First, we believe that every CSP must have a governance strategy, every cloud service provider. Otherwise, they could be sued. This would include statements, statements as to whether the cloud is compliant with all the regulations and laws and the privacy policy of the cloud. I'm going to check that before I send it to you. In addition, the CSP must also include statements as to the availability of the cloud, 
the organization that is used using the cloud also has a responsibility, right? Not just me, but my organization towards the governance. The organization has to ensure that it's not being careless and deploying attacks on the cloud via malware. It has to abide by all the policies enforced by the cloud. So the organization must also educate its employees on proper access to the cloud. So another question we've always think about, uh, the organization must have a person of authority who manages all the interactions with the cloud service providers. So typically you can say chief information security officer, right? Or should it be the chief information officer? Or should we have a chief cloud officer? Some companies are going with chief cloud officer, right? So that's the high level uh, overview. What are we looking at? Continuing, cloud governance means we've got to protect the cloud against cyber attacks and privacy violations, right? So we've got to make sure at the top level, like at the board and the CISOs and corporate vice presidents, let the people, you know, the technology people provide those solutions, but they are the ones who are ultimately responsible. You can't say, oh, my tech guy or my programmer made the mistake. They have to take responsibility. So protecting the cloud against cyber attacks and privacy violations should be top priority for every service provider. Once you put your data in the cloud, okay, then how can you ensure that your privacy is protected? Furthermore, how can your data be prevented by being stolen or maliciously? I mean, these are big challenges. Every cloud service provider must provide some assurance regarding the security and privacy. The clouds must be certified, right? You can't just go and operate a cloud. It has to be certified by some trusted authority about the level of security and privacy. They provide the cloud user must also ensure that he, she will abide by all the policies of the CSP. And then of course, risk and insurance. That's another big thing because just like any system, you want to carry a risk, carry risk, uh, I mean, compute risk. The idea is to carry out risk analysis for various computing systems with respect to cyber attacks and subsequently utilize various risk and mathematical models and compute insurance uh, amounts. More and more companies are now offering cyber risk insurance as corporations adopt cloud services and CSPs provide such services. Risk analysis for the cloud has to be carried out so that so you've got to Look at the risk, right? Is the cloud in a tornado area? Or has the cloud been attacked before? Or is the cloud in uh, in sort of a fire hazard uh, environment, right? So you have to compute the risk. And from a CSP's point of view, risk is not only analyzed with respect to attacks, but also compliance and so on. So for example, a CSP must carry out risk analysis and determine the number of hours a week the cloud will be down or in operation. And it has to be in agreement. With the cloud user, it has to then purchase insurance in case it cannot fulfill its obligations and agreements. So uh, you can do qu qu quantitative risk, qualitative risk, and so on, right? In summary, the various risk analysis and insurance models for computing systems have to be explored. So whatever we are doing for computer systems, networks, database systems, and so on, it has to be examined for the cloud. And uh, OK, so I've got OK, two more. Uh, evaluation, certification, accreditation. You can't just bring the cloud in. So you've got to evaluate, is it secure? Somebody has to certify. That means make sure, bring the cloud into an environment. I mean, use the cloud and test test it. Um, or, or even the service provider may have to do that. Then accredit it, some high level manager, both, both parties, service provider and the, and the user side organization will have to sign off. There are all standards and procedures. Uh, one of the success stories in the cybersecurity field is that we have got good uh, methods now to evaluate, accredit, and certify with the National Computer Security Center and the National Security Agency, right? So we need similar criteria for the clouds. That is, we need answers to questions. Is the cloud secure? Does the cloud maintain the privacy? Is the cloud compliant with the regulations? Does the cloud satisfy security policies? Does cloud governance include the extra, include the data governance and process governance? NIST has come up with various standards for the cloud, and so we need ways to evaluate and certify and accredit. We believe that organizations such, such as NIST should develop criteria. So that's really important. NIST plays a major role here. So I think this is my last chart and maybe have directions. Cloud strategy has to be integrated with the business. You can't have cloud in, in one, operating one and business somewhere else because Eventually, is it worth for the corporation to employ a cloud or to, to deploy a cloud? 
or should it have its own cloud or rent a cloud? Since most corporations are moving their data and processes to the cloud, a cloud strategy has to complement or work in, work in tangent with the business strategy. This means any risks as well as security and compliance issues for the cloud have to be taken into consideration when formulating the business strategy. The loss of data in the cloud or attacks to the processes will have an impact, cyber insurance, because if you are attacked a lot, you, your insurance premiums will go up, just like if you fall sick a lot or if you meet with accidents, your car insurance will go up. Therefore, we need cloud and cybersecurity experts to work together. That means we need roles, CISO, CCO, cloud security officer, CFO, CEO. They all have to work together. So now the last one, sorry. What are the responsibilities of the corporate officers and the board? We cannot expect every officer to report to the CEO. There's one CEO, if you have chief data officer, chief AI officer, chief cloud officer, chief operating officer. So I don't know, I'm not really, I mean, you, and Yola, I'm talking to people in the business school, so y'all can come up with some maybe good strategies. Perhaps some of them could report to COO. In addition, importance of cloud should also be taken into consideration. You know, how important is the cloud for the organization? If cloud is vital, then you need a cloud officer, right? Regardless, we believe that there should be, I think if you're using, using a cloud, we need a cloud officer. As, uh, and perhaps he or she could report to CIO. As cloud ga clouds gain more prominence and become an integral part of the organization, then more prominence could be given to the cloud uh, officer. Uh, another question is, should the corporate board, okay, so we have all this cloud in the, in the, in the corporate VPs, right, the board, the other ones, yeah, they have fiduciary duty, they've got to make sure everything is operated and everything is, all the accounts are kept, so should we have someone, so I have argued that we need someone, cybersecurity person in the board, similarly, do we need a cloud person, at least we need some people knowledgeable, right, so that's what I'm saying. I'm saying we need, especially with AI, you know, getting really big, we need cybersecurity in the board, AI in the board. So the answer with respect to the cloud depends on the extent to which the corporation depends on the cloud. So now I have one last chart. Cloud computing and web services provide infrastructure for scalable big data security and privacy. Infrastructure can be used, uh, can be used, host many data, uh, can be used to host many big data security and privacy applications. Applications are privacy aware, policy based, quantified self, assured information sharing, Internet of Things, and science and engineering applications. Again, cloud governance is key. If you want to rent a cloud, use a cloud, whatever, or if you want to operate a cloud, you need cloud governance. Integration of cloud computing and machine learning is essential for many applications, including for security. Cloud can be used for security applications, but the cloud must be secure. So security as a service versus secure cloud, okay? So remember, cloud has to be secure and cloud can also provide security applications. Now that is uh, taken about, right? It's, uh, sorry about this. This is something always this comes up. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so it took me about, I started around 7.30, I had a little bit of introduction. Anyway, it took me about uh, 50, 50 to 55, 55 minutes. So I might, I might have to cut short a little bit. So anyway, so I will see you uh, exactly in about 90 minutes, okay? And again, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm going to, you know, share this uh, presentation with Dr., with video with Dr. Ritu. So, uh, and put it in the box and then share my box and share it with her. And uh, okay, so I'll see you in 90 minutes and thank you very much.